All right. Let's make sure that we are streaming so far. Boom. There it is. Boom. We got the notification, you guys. We got the notification that things are live. Things are happening. Looks like it's about 30 seconds behind, and that's okay. Uh, if you're joining the show, or if you have joined the show, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button and hit the share button. Uh, I'm going to be doing a little bit of that in the beginning, as, as we all know, uh, as I do <laughs> every Sunday when I go live. The first few minutes are a little awkward, because I am uh, sharing it out to uh, my profile page. I'm sharing it out to a couple of different groups. So if you are here uh, and if you would like to help out, uh, please share this out with as many people as you possibly can. That would be uh, super, super helpful to me to uh, make sure that this awkward beginning of every Sunday live stream is a little... Uh, a little bit more streamlined, um, but we got we got a couple of fun topics to talk about today. And uh, actually, one of the things that I will do is do this. Uh, if you want to leave a comment, I usually do a check in at the top of the, the show, at the top of every every Sunday, uh, well, every video that I do, just to check in to be to talk to you guys about what what's going on with me on a personal level. But if you guys want to do that. Uh, in the comment section, um, and then we can talk about that uh, at the top of the show uh, as I give you my check-in as well. Um, and Keep going with those shares in the comment. Computer's also running a little slow. And I think I know why it's running a little slow uh, today as well. I can only do so many shares because uh, it will think that I'm not a real person <laughs> pretty soon. Uh, so I try not to overdo the shares. Yeah, the computer is definitely running slow. That's a bummer. What? What are you doing? Ah. Okay, we are going to be kicking off in just a few minutes. Please hit that share button. Please hit the like button. Get the word out to some folks. We'll be kicking this thing off in just a few minutes. If you would like to share your own checking, please leave that in the comments, and we will take a look at that and talk about that together as a group uh, in, in just a few minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. And we got a few little things to do here, and then we'll be, uh, we'll be, we'll be rocking and rolling. And we'll kick off this live stream situation that's going on here. I'm a one-man working machine, you guys. Uh, you know, so it's just me kind of operating everything, doing all the sharing, doing all the uh, technical aspects of this stuff. So uh, pardon the delays and pardon the uh, minor level of awkwardness that the that these um, live streams usually start with. Um, you know, I'm. I'm 
trying to get the word out to as many people as, as I can. The topics that I talk about aren't particularly uh, liked by Facebook. Uh, they tend to um, suppress the content a little bit, which is why I ask everybody to share as much as they, uh, as much as they can. That way um, the word goes out, more people can join in uh, and, uh, and we all, we all can have a good time together, uh, talking about a bunch of crazy shit. So, um, yeah, I'm going to do a few of these, uh, invites to get some people into the, uh, into the, into the show. If you are here, once again, please do leave a comment, uh, about how you're doing, about your check-in. Please share this out with as many people as you possibly can. Uh, let people know that we're, we're, we're live and we're doing this thing. The more people that join us, the more, the more fun it will be, I think. We're almost done. A few people I know regularly tune, tune into the show and make sure I invite them a couple of people that I know would like to be in, in the show and have missed a few uh, make sure I invite them as well I mean everybody's really invited to come hang out um, okay we got one more round of shares Okay, cool. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining in. I think I've done as much as uh, I can. It's been a few minutes of, of me um, doing doing the shares and all that. Uh, uh, as per usual, we'll do a check-in at the top of the show. Let me get rid of this banner. Um, I'm doing pretty good today. Uh, fun, fun little news. I did do my... Uh, test show for Zoom yesterday, and uh, it went great. It went swimmingly. Uh, I'm very pleased with it. Everybody else seemed to be uh, pretty pleased with it as well. Um, so I'm going to do the real thing. Uh, it's looking like it's going to be May 8th, but I'm going to make that decision uh, later tonight. Um, and then I will put up a ticket link and a Facebook event Um and uh, figure out topics and things of that sort for the show. So if you attended the Zoom test show, th first of all, thank you. You're fucking amazing, and I love you. Um, yeah, uh, it, it was it was really great. Um, it was it was fun to walk through some stuff. We worked out a few little kinks here and there, um, and uh, figured out like how to um, how to kind of introduce the show and and what kind of little things i need to uh let people know about so um it is imperative that with these zoom shows that uh, i know i'm asking a lot here but you read the description of the show because it's going to have some key instructions on like how to make it a a, a, a you just a nice event for everybody uh to make sure there are as le as little glitches as possible um so the next one is going to be announced within the next day or so um, I want to try to do them on a consistent day of the week because, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to just sporadically pick a, pick a day and just randomly throw them up. I want to have a consistent day of the week because I think we could all use a little bit of consistency, um, th th especially during the, the, the quarantine times. Uh, I think that's kind of an, an important thing, um, so right now it's probably looking to be Fridays at 9 p.m. But uh, that might change. I don't know. Uh, that seems to be the general consensus that most people prefer it to be on a, on a Friday night a little bit later so that if you do have kids and things, um, that, you know, the, the little youngsters and stuff, they can go to bed and then you can come in and join. Uh, the way that I'm going to run the ticketing for these things is it's going to be five bucks. And I'm going to limit the first probably one or two of them to 20 people. Um, and then if you're a sustaining member, uh, I'm going to give you a code to get a free ticket because you're a sustaining member and you contribute to helping me out every single month. 
Um, if you, uh, so that's another 17, 20 tickets, something along those lines. And then, um, and then it's like special guests and stuff will be included in that. Um, and then I'm going to do a thing where uh, I'm going to have five to 10 additional tickets uh, that I'm going to reserve for um, as free. Uh, basically, so that's gonna in, that's gonna kind of involve if somebody sees that the show is happening and they go, oh man, this is five bucks. I would love to see the show, but I I just can't I just can't drop five bucks into it. Uh, please message me. Please email me. Please send me some kind of a a a smoke signal of something. Um, and let me know, hey, I'm going through a tough time. I would love to see your show. Great, boom. Here's a code. Free ticket. Come hang out at the show. Um, so I'm going to have about five to 10 of those reserved for the show. It'll be probably more intimate um, to kind of leave it at that setting for now. Um, I might open it up if, if the, if the demand is there, if the popularity is there, I might open it up to do a little bit more. Um, now with these zoom shows, I will say there are going to be parts of the show that are going to be different for each one. Um, I'm doing a segment of the show where I'm talking about current events, uh, similarly to what these videos are, uh, but they'll be a little bit more constructed, a little bit more interactive and dynamic. Um, there's going to be parts of the show that are going to be consistent, that are going to be like a regular stand-up show. Like if you come to see me two or three times in the year, you are going to hear some of the same jokes again, but they're going to be a little bit more polished. They're going to be a little bit more... Um, better constructed. They're going to have uh, ideas that are uh, a little bit different. So, you know, if you do want to attend multiple of these shows, just keep that in mind. There's going to be parts of the show that'll be different, but parts of the show are also going to be uh, relatively the same as well. But, uh, you know, that's sort of the way that I'm uh, operating this thing moving forward uh, so that people that do come back to see the show on, on multiple times uh, get to uh, get to experience something new for parts of the show, uh, and people that have never seen the show get to experience the whole thing, you know, in a, in a in in their own special little newness is is sort of how I'm I'm, I'm trying to build this thing so that uh, if we do have consistent people that want to come back and see the show multiple times, there is some elements of sameness, but there's also a lot of elements of of difference as well. Um, so keep an eye out for those tickets. The second thing that I'm kind of excited about right now is the Pittsburgh Fringe is going virtual. The Pittsburgh Fringe is going virtual. Uh, my show is a storytelling show. Uh, I'm doing one show. That's it. Just because it's a storytelling show and I kind of don't want to overdo it. It's going to be done through Zoom. So it'll kind of operate the same way that I'm operating these shows. So you purchase a ticket uh, or, or you register for the event because I'm kind of going to do it as a free event and you can just throw in some donations and I'll put in my donation link um, much like I do for these Facebook live videos or Facebook premiere videos. Um, and they're going to be some stories from the road, probably three to four stories, no more than four, because uh, it's going to be about an hour and I'm going to make it interactive with some images and things of that sort. Um, so that is May 2nd. That's coming up this Saturday, May 2nd, this Saturday. Uh, you can go to pittsburghfringe.org and uh, and get your tickets. Uh, let me put a comment on that right now. Um, tickets for Pittsburgh Fringe. Let's see if that goes through. I did it through. I did it through the Streamyard thing. Yeah, it went through. So um, yeah, tickets for that show are pittsburghfringe.org. You can check my show out there, uh, 9.30. That's when it's going up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, ticket links for that and a Facebook event for that uh, available pretty soon uh, within the next day or so. Within the next day or so, I will also have, um, I will also have a, uh, uh, a link up to the uh, Facebook event. Uh, or the, I'm sorry, the Zoom show. I'm, I'm losing my words here. Uh, doing, doing, doing multiple things, doing multiple things. Uh, but um, that's sort of really all I have for the check-in. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to do these shows. It kind of gives me a, a set of purpose, um, something to kind of look forward to, something to like work towards again. 
Not that these shows aren't, these are sort of the daily goals that I have, but this is sort of like a long-term goal. The other thing is I'm probably going to lose the majority of June. Uh, even if we open back up in June, even if things go back to the way, you know, um, of us coming back out and uh, going to bars and going to events, um, there's a likelihood that people are still going to be scared and concerned. Um, there's a collective PTSD that's happening with these things. There's a lot of people that are nervous. There's a lot of people that are saying, open it back up. This is bullshit. So there's, there's a lot of push and pull with this thing. And even if we say the stay at home orders are lifted in June, um, it's going to take people a little while to uh, pull out of that fear uh, and go back to live events, go back to large crowd events. So we're looking at probably having some venues that are going to take some precautions for a little while. Um, which means that I'll, I might, I might be back on the road at the end of June and then into July. But, you know, July is a tough month for, for touring artists. And, um, uh, I think I have like two or three shows and maybe a fringe festival in July. Uh, I do have a fringe festival. I'm doing the St. Louis fringe in August for sure. And the Elgin fringe in September for sure. And what I might end up having to do is just not worry about June and July and push forward into August and into the fall and do a lot of rescheduling of all the shows that I lost um, in March, April, and May and the front half of July and focus on trying to book for the fall. So with that in mind, these Zoom comedy shows that I'm going to be doing, um, you know, those are those are going to be what I will probably end up doing a lot more of um, for June and for July. So at least three months um, and maybe maybe even going forward, what I might end up doing is on the slow months, um, like June, like December and early January, I might, I might do a couple of the zoom shows, you know, kind of throw those in, um, every so often, because if they start going well, and if there is enough interest, I might be able to do those to, uh, kind of keep myself fresh, um, and, uh, and, and all that sort of stuff. And if you can't see the Zoom shows, I am going to be releasing clips and stuff like that, too. So, so that'll also be part of the plan. Okay, all right. We've, we've talked about a bunch of stuff. Um, uh, and as, as usual, go ahead and leave a comment. I will be reading them at the end of each segment um, as a way that you can participate in the, in the live stream. Uh, we have three fun stories today for you guys um, that I hope you guys will enjoy some interesting topics that I don't think we cover very, uh, that I haven't been able to cover as often. So leave a comment as we go through this thing. And then at the end of each segment, I'm going to read them and, and respond to them, uh, you know, so that we all know which, which ones we're talking about. So let's, let's get into the first one. So I watched an interview with uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald who uh, started The Intercept and is uh, most famously known for the Edward Snowden files. Edward Snowden, when he found out about the NSA um, peering into our cameras and peering into all of the things that we do, he went to a couple different journalists to talk about, hey, this is what I have. This is how I would like to reveal it. And uh, Glenn Greenwald was the one that he chose because Glenn Greenwald, um, in Edward Snowden's words, was the one that was the most genuine about um, reporting on the NSA's, uh, you know, uh, violation of the Fourth Amendment. So uh, Greenwald has been in Brazil uh, with with his husband and his children because his husband is part of. Uh, Brazilian politics. So he's lived in Brazil for uh, quite some time now. Um, and so he's been, he basically opened up his own, uh, his own wing of um, the Intercept in Brazil. He opened up his own wing of the Intercept in Brazil. And um, he kind of revealed a bunch of corruption stuff. He reported on a bunch of corruption stuff. Now he's, he was pretty much like uh, always um reporting on that sort of stuff he was always reporting on brazilian corruption he was always reporting on um 
freeing Lula da Silva, who was uh, who was wrongfully imprisoned. Um, he did a lot of interviews with Lula, kind of a, a getting his side of the story um, and doing a lot of reporting that way. Now, Operation Car Wash basically revealed all of the right wing corruption and the right wing collusion, um, specifically in regards to Lula, to, to put Lula da Silva in prison. Um, and the way this happened was a mid-level money launderer uh, got caught. He got he got imprisoned and uh, freaked out and basically said, "Look, I have all of this information um, about these uh, political impri imp improprieties um, of top level, you know, uh, politicians and well known Brazilian billionaires, and uh, and you know, for a lighter sentence, I would uh, very much like to, um, you know, very much like to uh, uh, make a deal here." I'll give you all of these records and we'll make a deal. So that's what he did. And it involved a lot of Brazilian billionaires and politicians that ended up going to prison. Now, uh, the judge serving this case, uh, you know, because it went to trial and stuff, uh, Judge Morrow was this guy's name. He was pretty biased. He had a major right wing bias. Now, the judges are not supposed to be biased. They're supposed to be impartial. They're supposed to be impartial. And uh, this judge was pretty damn biased, uh, pretty pretty major uh, right wing bias, and he acted basically as a right wing covert operative um, to ensure that all of his judgments would destroy the worker party. That's what he was trying to do. Now the party, the worker party, had been um, the majority party. It was gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, a lot of people supported the worker party since 2002. It's been that way. Um, Judge Morrow is responsible for finding Lula da Silva uh, guilty on a bunch of like major corruption charges uh, that were never really proven, uh, that seemed kind of wishy-washy. Um, so uh, Judge Morrow uh, was, the, was the reason why Lula da Silva of the Worker Party, the more popular Worker Party, was imprisoned, which um, uh, it eventually led to Bolsonaro winning in 2018. And Bolsonaro, for what he did to destroy the Worker Party in, uh, or or at least seemingly destroy the Worker Party, I would say it's it's probably destabilized and, and not as much in power right now. Um, Judge Moro got appointed basically the second highest position in uh, in Brazilian politics, right? So he's basically like um, Bolsonaro's right hand man. If you don't know Jair Bolsonaro, Jair Bolsonaro is. Um, is the authoritarian militaristic dictator leader of Brazil. That's what he is. Um, he is anti-indigenous people. He's anti-environmentalism. He basically doesn't believe in any sort of left-wing politics. Um, when the Amazon was uh, burning, when there was a lot of forest fires happening in Amazon, he was partially responsible for it by encouraging uh, ranchers and farmers in that live anywhere in, near the Amazon uh, to conduct uh, larger controlled burns that weren't really being controlled. Like he was he was expanding the notion of controlled burns and then basically saying, well, nature does this all the time. We're just kind of helping it out. We're, we're, we're being stewards of nature by, you know, increasing controlled burns. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, during this pandemic, uh, he's basically like, well, we're all going to die one day. So why bother doing anything at all? Like that's his excuse for literally not doing anything during this pandemic. Like his excuse is we're all going to die one day. Who cares? So that's who Jair Bolsonaro is, right? Now Bolsonaro right now uh, and Bolsonaro's administration um, are kind of attacking Glenn Greenwald for this reason. In May of 2019, there was a whistleblower, an anonymous source, that gave Glenn Greenwald a bunch of documents, a bunch of transcripts uh, about corruption and collusion uh, involving the framing and imprisonment of Lula da Silva uh, by Judge Morrow, specifically by Judge Morrow. Um, and, you know, G Greenwald did what a journalist does, and he went through these uh, documents and things that uh, the, the source gave him, and he uh did the investigative part of what journalism is rather than just being like look at what trump tweeted which is what a lot of american journalism does is is being like look at these tweets aren't they crazy and it's just like no you didn't really do journalism like that's 
You just looked at somebody's Twitter feed and wrote a fucking blog about it. That's kind of what you did. Um, so he did the reporting, and then in by June, he started publishing um, all of the information that he had discovered, right? This involved uh, calling out the legitimacy of Judge Morrow's stance on some of the anti-corruption laws. Like Moro and Jair Bolsonaro came out and made the statement about like how they're, oh, they're anti-corruption. They're the anti-corruption candidates, right? Very similarly to what uh, a lot of other right-wing populist candidates do, including Trump, including Trump. Uh, Trump also kind of did this thing uh, where he was like, I'm against corruption. I don't like corruption. You know, I'm, I'm going to be the straight arrow fucking candidate. I'm going to say it like it is, baby. I'm going to say it like it is. What's that? Let's talk about black people. Like, it's one of those things where you're just like, oh, no. Oh, no. What misinformed fucking opinion are you going to throw out there as a fact? So, um, this revelation in June, by publishing these documents in June, Lula da Silva eventually becomes free. He gets free. Uh, and uh, Glenn Greenwald becomes the, dar the target of the Bolsonaro government. And uh, there's a bunch of shit that they levied against him, right? Like, uh, they went after him because Greenwald is gay, and they went after his husband in, 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 Br in the Brazilian parliament, and, uh, and then they called him a hack. They didn't call him a journalist. They called him a hacker. Um, Judge Morrow started uh, 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 an, a, a criminal investigation into Glenn Greenwald's finances, uh, right? Like he was looking at all of his financial things to see if there was some kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a fucking uh, uh, an agenda behind the money. Oh, you know, like all th so all this stuff had to be stopped, though, because the Supreme Court in Brazil was basically like, yo, you guys are infringing on Brazil, Brazil's constitution, which guarantees freedom of press. You can't fucking do this shit. You're going against Brazilian constitution. So in January of this year, all this is happening last year, by the way, um, Operation Car Wash got revealed in June of 2019. And by January 2020, after all this, so roughly, what, six, seven months later, um, there was an indictment against Glenn Greenwald. Uh, basically saying that Greenwald uh, was a conspirator. He was trying to overthrow the government. Um, he's gay, and that's the crate. That what gay in Brazil? Who could have even thought that you could even do something with the public and the Bolsonaro and the and the? I mean, the Amazon's fire probably is caused by just the flamboyancy of the gay people. You know, the 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 dancing causes a lot of friction, which causes a lot of heat, and then the Amazon's on fire because of the gay people. <laughs> Got to indict them. Got to indict them. You know. So they levied a bunch of bullshit against um, Greenwald. And then eventually the Supreme Court was just like, no, nah, we're not going to consider this indictment to be like a real thing. Uh, and they basically said, because it's uh, going against Brazilian constitution. It's going against Brazil's constitution for freedom of the press. Uh, so we can't, like this indictment, we can't consider this to be a real indictment. Um, so now it's an appeal. They're trying to reissue all the criminal um, conspiracy charges uh, of Greenwald's reporting. So, uh, just to kind of review what the fuck just happened and to kind of play a little compare and contrast situation, right? We're going to do a little compare and contrast situation. Uh, a right-wing authoritarian fascist government is calling a journalist and a hacker a criminal for revealing massive crimes to remove a pro-worker leader out of political dominancy. That's happening in Brazil, which is run by a right-wing authoritarian fascist, basically a fascist. Uh, this is virtually no different than what America is trying to do to Julian Assange. This is virtually no different than what Americans are trying to do to Julian Assange, right? They call him a hacker for publishing war crimes. They call him, uh, they, they're calling him a hacker for publishing corporate fraud. They, they currently have him on trial for a fucking, a, a, a bullshit law from 109 years ago that is virtually like 
shouldn't even be in existence. Like even when that law was put into place, the Espionage Act, which is what I'm talking about, the Espionage Act, when it was put into place 109 years ago, people were like, hey, this doesn't seem like this is a great idea. And a fucking Democrat put that law into place. And that law basically said during wartime, you're not allowed to criticize or say anything about the American military because then we can just call it treason. So because he revealed American war crimes, they're like, oh, he's committing treason. And it's like that dude's an Australian. Julian Assange isn't even American. Right. And this was all done. The 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 animosity that was started towards whistleblowers and towards Julian Assange and WikiLeaks really kicked off um, during the Obama administration. Really kicked off during the Obama administration. While in the Obama administration, he had to seek asylum into the Ecuadorian embassy in the UK. That didn't happen because of Trump. That happened because of Obama and the way that Obama dealt with. Uh, so, again, a Democrat set up a surveillance state a democrat got called out for for war crimes for revealing a republican's war crimes right a, like let me rephrase that julian assange revealed republican war crimes under a democrat's administration and the response for that democrat was this guy needs to be imprisoned so he had to seek asylum in the ecuadorian embassy and they're calling him a hacker and they're calling him all this shit That, how is that any different than how a right-wing authoritarian proto-fascist government is reacting to a journalist? Really, all this thing creates is um, an atmosphere of fear. That's really what it creates. It creates, and that's what it's supposed to do. Um, it's supposed to create this atmosphere of fear and uh, um, c cause a lot of confusion about what journalism actually is. Um, and, and, it, and it pushes you know, reporters to take legal defense of their own work. That's really what it does. It pushes, it pushes reporters to take legal defense of their own work, right? Defend the fact that they, are, they do have the freedom of the press rather than why are these authoritarian governments um, disregarding the freedom of the press. Uh, so they, you know, file these lawsuits, right? They, they fire, file a lawsuit against Glenn, Glenn Greenwald um, over criminal conspiracy charges. They file uh, a lawsuit against uh, Julian Assange over a 109-year-old law that was controversial to begin with, uh, that seemed very authoritarian for a democratic governor, government to do. And they tie up a lot of their resources and a lot of their time in defending themselves, in defending these 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 allegations. Um, and now it makes it harder and harder for them to do the reporting that they normally would do. Um, and it makes it harder and harder for them to push back against uh, the government taking rights away from people, the government doing illegal things, right? I mean, this was sort of the, uh, you know, the, the way that even the Obama administration handled Glenn Greenwald. The Obama administration in 2013 to 2014, when, when Snowden revealed the files himself, Glenn Greenwald was threatened by the Obama administration. Uh, Green, uh, Greenwald was a journalist. He just reported on it. And they said, like, they're going to detain him and... Um, you know, like they're going to question him and do all the shit to him. Um, you know, they like they went into uh, the Guardian and made them delete the one computer where uh, the, the Snowden files were held, uh, you know. And uh, I mean, this is, does this sound like a democracy at this point? This is under the Obama administration. They did this. Liberals were acting like dictators. They held Glenn Greenwald's husband in custody at a German airport. All because he published what the NSA was actually doing. Now, the Trump administration pushed on Assange, right? Um, so basically, this war on whistleblowers was kind of, you know, blown wide open. I'm not saying Obama was the person that started the war on whistleblowers or anything like that. I'm, I'm saying more or less like, um, you know, um, 
he kind of perpetuated it. He kind of pushed it forward. Um, and then he kind of made it more difficult trying to sway public opinion on what whistleblowers were doing, on uh, being able to challenge a government's authoritarian role uh, as as people. And, uh, the, and he kind of opened the doors to let the Trump administration get more authoritarian about the way that they're going to treat uh, whistleblowers, right? So, so, you know, he, the Obama administration didn't want to touch Assange. They just didn't want to touch Assange. They were like, eh, it seems like a bad thing. They commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence. They did not uh, pardon her. They did not pardon Chelsea Manning. They just commuted the sentence, which meant that uh, if at any point they were like, hey, we changed our minds, they could just do that, which is what it let the Trump administration do. So, so Obama essentially handed the keys of continuing the surveillance state on continuing this war on whistleblowers over to, to Donald Trump. And the Trump administration decided that they were going to prosecute Assange by saying that uh, his, uh, you know, his source, uh, Chelsea Manning, was coerced into backing, um, uh, to, uh, not backing, but hacking the um, uh, uh, the military uh, to get the, to to get to the the video files that revealed that uh, you know American troops were firing on civilians in the Middle East on purpose. They knew that they were civilians, and they still fired on them. Uh, when the reality is she, she didn't need a password. She didn't need to hack into anything. She had access to all the stuff to begin with. So it was kind of a moot point. Um, and not just that, but Julian Assange was protecting his sources, which is something that you do in journalism. That is your right as a journalist to protect your sources so that you don't put their life in harm's way. Um, so None of what Julian Assange was doing was illegal by any means, but the Trump administration kind of warped the words and the Obama administration, because of the way that the Obama administration had treated whistleblowers to begin with, uh, this kind of left you know the doors wide open for that kind of shit. Now, Gr Greenwald's case is a, a, just a tad different because they're not saying that uh, he coerced the, um, the whistleblower uh, to give him information or to go and hack the government or anything of that sort. Um, and not, and nor did this whistleblower do any of those things either. Uh, but they, the, the, the whistleblower said, should I keep copies of our conversations? Um, and Greenwald was basically like, you, you don't necessarily have to do it. Uh, you, you can, if you would like to, but I also am keeping track of everything. I'm also keeping uh, copies of all of our, um, uh, 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 you know, all of our thing, uh, like all of our, our our conversations and things of that sort. Um, so you don't necessarily have to, but I'm not going to tell you what to do either way. If you feel comfortable with deleting it, delete it. If you feel more comfortable keeping it, then keep it. So they're basically saying that that by saying, hey, I'm keeping copies of it and you technically don't have to, that Greenwald was coercing him to like destroy evidence or something along those lines, uh, which is realistically like not really, a, like, that's that's not the right, like it's an inaccurate charge to throw on Greenwald. So how do we kind of combat the fear, that it, the atmosphere of fear, um, especially when it comes towards whistleblowers and the treatment of whistleblowers? Well, we have to look at principle over personalities because a lot of people will come out and be like, oh, well, you know, he's guilty because, well, Greenwald, I don't like his personality. So obviously he's got to be guilty. Obviously, this guy's kind of a dick. You know, I don't like the way that he says certain things. I, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't have a beer with Julian Assange. So he's got to be guilty. It's like, that's, first of all, that's not a legal defense. You can't go into a fucking courtroom and be like, your honor look at this guy. Is this somebody you want to sit down and have a fucking beer with? Huh? Huh? Guilty. Guilty. Cause he doesn't, he, that's not a beer situation. Huh? So we got to throw this guy in prison so that we can all live in a world of unity where we're all having beers with each other. And this guy, I don't know if he wants to have a beer, you know, he doesn't look like a beer kind of guy. Maybe he's a, he's one of those wine people. I don't know. I don't know. He's a sommelier. That's guilt. That's like not a legal defense, but you got to look at what the principles are. Uh, what did he reveal? What did Julian Assange reveal? What did Glenn Greenwald reveal? What did Edward Snowden reveal? Did he reveal that your rights are being trampled on? Did he reveal that um, that uh, the 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 government is committing war crimes and trying to hide those? Why are they trying to hide crimes? 
aren't we going to use that you know same excuse of if you have nothing to hide then why would it this be a problem if this was uh, open to the public um you know none of these revelations have caused mass death or a a compromise of of national security or anything so they can't claim any of that right with julian assange um both sides hate him the left hates him because of the clinton revelations but they completely ignore what the clinton revelations actually showed um you know they they showed that they the the democratic party the dnc was ready to use anti-semitism against bernie sanders uh, and, and the right hates him for basically everything else, basically every fucking thing else. Um, you know, and they claim these notions of conspiracy. Um, and that's a very dangerous thing because what it ends up doing is if you start claiming this notion of conspiracy that, oh, these people went behind, you know, they were sending texts back and forth. They were on signal. They had encrypted emails and they were planning these things. Um, it, and, and then, and then it criminalizes protests. That's really dangerous because, you know, then, then we can't organize and come together and protest the government, which is our right to do. And once you start criminalizing those things, that's how our rights get taken away. And the way that they criminalize this thing is by creating a, a, a virtue of fear, uh, by going against personality over principle. They make you choose a personality rather than stick to your principles. Um, and, you know, we already have laws that do that. We already have laws in place that are criminalizing protests. Uh, there's an ALEC law that uh, deems things like fucking pipelines and telecom towers as uh, critical infrastructure. And if you protest them, you, go, you can go to prison for up to 20 years, be fined up to $100,000. Um, you know, there's already laws that are kind of in place. So if we don't support the people uh, that are ensuring that these rights can be um, can be exercised and you won't be put into prison for them, uh, then more and more of these rights are going to be, uh, taken away from us and they're going to be taken away from us while we are not paying attention. Okay. So we're going to go to our second story. Uh, which is the 2017 Brazil general strike. Uh, Brazil had a general strike in 2017 where they shut down the whole country for like a day. Uh, for a whole day, they shut down the whole country. And this was in, in regards to uh, labor reforms. And what these labor reforms were doing were they were increasing the age of retirement from 55 to 65. And then they were changing the way that pensions were going to be done because pensions are no longer... Uh, going to be equivalent of the wages that you get at the end of your career, right? Uh, at the time of retirement, uh, they are going to be a median of uh, of all of your wages that you have had throughout the years. Uh, and in order for you to even get that, you have to be in the workforce for 49 years. And uh, that's crazy um, because now it's essentially like you've lost half of your pension. You've just lost half of your wages out of out of pension. Uh, so people got pissed and then not only that, but they were also going to increase the work day from eight to 12 hours. And then they were going to cut the lunch break from an hour, an hour and a half down to 30 minutes. And this was a labor reform that was done by, uh, uh, what Timor, uh, Timor was, uh, put into power. He was Dilma Rousseff's VP, Dilma Rousseff. She got impeached over, um, uh, uh, corruption and financial, um, financial corruption charges specifically. And, uh, so he was her VP and he, he, he took power and he was like wildly unpopular. It was wildly unpopular. I mean, he was putting reforms like this out. So there was a general strike in April of 2017, where they shut the whole nation down. This was led by labor unions and student marches, and there was demonstrations, and people were marching around the city, and they shut the whole fucking city down, right? Like, banks weren't open, no public transportation was open, stores weren't open, government employees didn't show up. Um, and, you know, there was back and forth on, on how different uh, government leaders handled it. 
where there were some government leaders that were like, hey, fucking go do it, man. Like, yeah, if you if this is what you feel like you need to do to fight for your rights, then go fight for your rights. I support you wholeheartedly. And there were other government leaders that were just like, fuck you. How dare you? This is an insult to everything this country stands for. You know, like you're going to be docked pay. You might be fired. This is bullshit. And they just, you know, lost it. So most of the most of the demonstrations were pretty peaceful. Uh, most of the demonstrations were pretty peaceful. Uh, there was one student that got shot and had to be put into the ICU. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then after this, there were a bunch of right wing leadership that was just like, never happened, never happened, bro. What strike? What are you talking about? I've been at work all day. You know, I've been working hard. I've been kicking ass, taking names. What happened out there? I don't know. I don't know. Sounds like it's all fake news to me. You know, people strike the country. Nah, that's crazy. That, nobody would do that. That's not a thing that happened. So they just kind of rewrote this narrative, right? But here's something interesting. The Catholic Church of Brazil actually supported the strike. Is that correct? That's wild to me. That the Catholic Church was like, yes, we do support these strikes. We do support the, 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 the labor unions. So after this, it basically relayed these, or I'm sorry, delayed these uh, labor reforms, right? It delayed them. But they tried again in June. And when they brought it back up again in June, there was another round of strikes, right? And, and one of the other things that they added to this labor reform in June was that, uh, that these companies the bosses were going to be able to negotiate directly with the workers. Uh, why is that bad? Uh, because it takes collective bargaining um, off the table. Individual workers don't have the same representation as the entire collective. Uh, this gives an opportunity, and this happens in the States quite often, um, too, is it gives an opportunity for you know um, one employee to get a different raise than another employee. Um, and creates this un unneeded, unwarranted level of competition in the workplace where, you know, uh, oh, you want that 10% raise. Well, you should have stayed at the office longer than we needed you to. You just did the bare minimum. So now we're, we're not going to give you that 10% raise. Look at this guy. He's working for free. So we're going to give him a 10% raise and he'll still be working for free. And maybe in two years, we'll give him another 10% raise. It's bullshit like that. Uh, where they're like, oh, you can't talk about your salary because, you know, employee A might have more salary than employee B for doing the exact same job. Um, without that notion of collective bargaining in place, that's kind of what it eliminates. And this happened to me. I remember that uh, this happening to me at my very first real design job that I got when I got my graphic design degree. The first year I worked, you know, at... Uh, at these temp spots, shoe stores, retail shit. And I remember getting this job. It was great. It was fun. It was a really fun job. But I got paid like 20 grand a year. Um, and then I got a pay bump of after the first 30 days, because a 30 day trial period, they were going to give me 20K a year. They bumped me up to 22. Which, you know, is all, I mean, all this stuff is like pittance. Like, this is virtually nothing. Like, I'm barely making any money. Um, but I got 22 grand. And then um, about a year in, we were like trying to talk about like, hey, how do we get a raise here in this job? And my art director was like, we're going to talk to, you know, we're, we've been producing a lot of shit. I'm going to, I'm going to get you guys like a good raise. I'm going to negotiate like a good raise. And I went and I had my individual meeting with my art director. All of us had an individual meeting with our art director. And she was like, we can offer you 25 right now. And I was like, 25? Dude, this is like, this is crazy. And she was like, yeah, that's about as much as we can do. Um, you know, it'll go into immediate effect. And I was like, this is, I mean, fine. Yeah, I'll take the extra money, but you know, like we've been working really, really hard and putting out a whole bunch of stuff, having a little bit more than $25,000 a year would be kind of cool, would be great. And she was like, yeah, this is all I can do right now. 
so then I started talking to this other designer, right? And we were going back and forth and she was like, yeah, I went from, you know, and she'd worked there a little bit longer than me. Um, so she was, I think getting 25, but she was like, yeah, they bumped me up to 30,000. And I was like, what? And so by the end of my stay at this job, because I only stay there, I think three or four months after that. And I remember towards the end of it, I had this interview, I got this job offer and it was like a, it was, I was basically going to make double the amount of money. Um, and that job ended up sucking real hard too. But, uh, I remember talking to my art director and I was like, Hey, I've got this job offer. Here's what they're offering me. I'm, I'm, I'm not all about the money. Um, cause I like the environment here and I like the boutique structure of this place, but I know that some of the designers are making $30,000 and I'm asking for that. And she was like, I can't give you that. Like, she was just like, I'm, they're going to say no. Like the bosses are going to say no. And had I had a union that was, that was collectively bargaining for me and not just like a general manager, right? Had I had like a, a graphic design union to go in and negotiate for us in what we've been doing and how much what we should all be getting and how much of a salary increase we should all be getting, what the minimum salary that, that the designer should be making, uh, especially after a year of being there and things of that sort, um, we would have probably gotten a little bit more money. But this direct negotiation thing is basically them saying, oh, well, you know, we'll negotiate with the employees directly. And really what it is, is we're going to tell the employees what we're going to give them. And that's fucking that. It's not really a negotiation. Plus, at that point, uh, the Timor government was facing corruption charges. Uh, and there was calls for like fast tracking the election because uh, there was this massive increased popularity of Lula, who eventually we found out from the earlier story went to prison. Um, so, you know, they, this general, I mean, it literally just shut the country down. Uh, and it was like this huge push to make this worker party um, a lot more successful a lot more popular and people basically were like yeah we are more important than the fucking oligarchs that are that are pretending to be far more important than us so why would we not you know back a party or or back movements that are all all pro worker uh, now unfortunately that, that that didn't work out and the one thing we can take something that we would have to look for look look into and look be be ready to face this opposition is the fact that um, the right-wing government essentially levied a bunch of bullshit. They essentially levied a bunch of corruption charges and planted false, um, you know, uh, false evidence uh, that, you know, we saw Glenn Greenwald revealed. They revealed that, that, that uh, uh, Lula was set up. Um, and that is something that we're, we're going to have to keep an eye out for. Um, pending a general strike that comes into play, you know, labor movements become a little bit stronger. Um, the oligarchs start wavering, We're, you know, keep an eye out for corruption charges and uh, collusion and fake criminal investigations uh, towards these worker movements. That's something that we should, we should definitely be ready for. So our final story for the day is post-COVID-19 religiosity. Uh, will religiosity increase or decrease after COVID-19? Are we going to see more religiosity or are we going to see less religiosity uh, in the era of COVID-19? Um, now, we did see that there's a lot of pastors, a lot of Christian pastors, preachers, uh, that are basically asking folks to not socially distance, to not practice these safe guidelines, to break the stay-at-home orders, uh, you know, for Jesus. They want they want to do it for the for the big J, you know, the man upstairs. He's like, hey, get the fuck out of your houses, you know, let me see your faces. Uh, get out of your house, come into my house. I got some wine, we got some crackers, we got some books. Uh, we'll read you some stories, we'll tell you some things. Uh, come on out, gather in uh, <laughs> in groups of of hundreds. And uh, if you, my honest opinion is this, I think Jesus probably just wants to be left alone, especially, especially now, like, especially now 
It's just like I just want some peace and quiet. I've been I've been trying to get peace and quiet for two thousand years. You guys keep levying prayers and shit at me. I just want to like chill out. I just want to read some books. You know, fucking lay on a cloud. I don't know. Just leave me alone. The Family Research Council uh, said that these these churches that are calling for uh, people to um, go to attend these services are are in defiance of common sense. Um, and look, there's a lot of arguments, right? There's a lot of arguments of whether we should be quarantining as much as we are, whether should, we should be out there trying to gain antibodies. And there's a lot of issues. We don't know how this virus is operating. Uh, the severity of this uh, virus is higher than a f common flu. It is a uh, it is a a um, uh, a lung disease. Uh, it is an upper respiratory disease. So you know um, it does create a lot more complications than the common flu. Uh, COVID nineteen in the in the short amount of time has surpassed. Uh, what a common flu, flu would do in one year in terms of uh, casualties and fatalities. Um, so, you know, we're not really sure. Am I saying that the stay-at-home orders need to be put into place forever? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. What we need to do is use that common sense, right? If we know that the viruses are going to be transferred by, um, you know, uh, fluid mist or whatever, uh, yeah, it seems like the order for the masks is the right thing to do. Now, do we need to go crazy and overboard with it? Like if we're exercising, put a mask on your face? No, that's a little, that's a little ridiculous. You're, you're literally confining your, your breathing. You shouldn't do that. You need to be able to, you know, breathe and, uh, and have regular breathing when you exercise and putting a mask on is going to, uh, decrease that. Uh, should we keep a mask on when we are in our homes? No, that's a little over the top. Um, are there good viruses? Are there good bacteria that we need in our system? Absolutely. Do we need sunshine? Absolutely. Do we need to be interactive with each other as people? Absolutely. And we can all do that. Just right now, it has to be uh, in, in less amounts. That's what it needs to be. We have to do it just a little bit less so that later we can do it a lot more. There's a lot of other plans out there in terms of how we can regain um, you know, going back out to shows and restaurants and fucking getting your your dumbass haircuts. Um, there is a way to do that. Herd immunity. I've talked about herd immunity before, but herd immunity doesn't work if you don't have a plan. If you don't come up with how are we going to treat people when they get sick, when they get sick and start exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19, which is the disease, by the way, COVID-19 is not the virus. COVID-19 is the disease. The virus is SARS-CoV-2, which, similar to SARS-CoV-1, uh, is a uh, um, another upper respiratory disease, and um, and it and same thing, right? There was really no cure for it. We had to come up with a treatment plan. So it's like, okay, so how do we come up with a treatment plan for this disease so that it doesn't overwhelm our fucked up healthcare system, so that we don't need to. It, like people that have heart attacks and people that have like, you know, uh, emergency conditions that come up can still go to the hospital. Do we create treatment facilities for this? So all this stuff needs to be thought about, but none of that stuff is going to happen if these numbers spike way the fuck up. And, and they will, if we continue to just go out there and, you know, lick each other's faces like we were doing, um, just a little bit of this is going to be fine. You know, maybe don't go to church on Sundays. And that's sort of what, uh, uh, what, what they're, what they're kind of saying is, is just stay like chill out, stay at home. Um, you know, uh, there's different ways of, of still interacting with each other. We just have to be a little bit more creative. Um, really like this, this order though, it kind of reminds me of like a new way of, uh, uh, like a, like a new snake handling church. I don't know if you guys have heard about snake handling churches. My good friend Stuart Huff pointed me to snake handling churches. Brilliant comedian. Highly recommend you check out Stuart Huff. Um, but Stuart was telling Stuart has a bit about snake handling churches, and, and the and the gist of what snake handling churches are is uh, they give you like a live snake, 
and they make you hold it and it and the snake will bite you and if you don't die from the poison that's because you have the love of jesus um, now in most of these situations like they don't say that they have they have removed the poison venom glands from the snake or they've like defanged them enough that uh they're not going to poison you or anything so like it's kind of bullshit uh but this is sort of like the same thing right like it, conceptually speaking it's like come to the church uh gather in 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 a group of a couple hundred people keep your faith around and uh god will protect you god will protect you from the COVID, if you come to church on every Sunday with you and a hundred of your best people from your community and gather in a small space, sitting right next to each other, saying, peace be with you, you know, kind of singing songs really loud, spraying that mist into the air, touching each other's mist, spit covered hands, sharing all that peace. And God will protect you because if you don't get COVID, then you got God's love. If you got COVID, then you didn't have God's love. Just like if you got, if you died from the poison, you didn't have God's love, right? Not that you fucking got bit by a venomous snake. <laughs> like, like maybe don't get bit by a venomous snake. How about how about we just put that rule out there? That seems like a pretty fucking solid rule, right? <laughs> Which is like I feel like God's like, nah, bro. I don't I don't want you to I don't want you to leave your house. You know, like. I, God's God's been staying. I don't know if you've noticed, but God's been socially distancing himself from us for quite some time. You know, like the last time he took the form of man, he came down as Jesus. And that was like 2000 years ago. You know, God's like, no, nah, guys, I'm done. Like you guys are fucking nuts. You guys are fucking crazy. I'm going to socially distance myself from you guys for like, I don't know. Um, what's for, how long is forever? Cause that's, that's how long I think I'm going to socially distance myself for forever. You guys are nuts. You guys are fucking nuts. But these evangelicals, um, and these hardcore Christians, they, they are not, um, they're worried that if they exercise this level of caution, that it's going to take people away from the faith. That's what they're concerned about. Uh, they're they're worried that if they side with science, if they side with logic and morality, then this this magic notion of faith that your faith will protect you and your faith will save you all the time, and that's a that's an absolute that people can believe in, uh, will no longer have power. And if they don't have power, how the fuck are they going to exploit poor people and steal money from them? You got to be able to exploit people if you're going to take money from them. Now, there have been online services, right? Um, there's been a bunch of churches um, that um, that have online services that are doing like Zoom services, you know, uh, just like I'll, I'm doing like Zoom comedy shows. They're doing Zoom services. But the problem is um, attendance to these have been reported to be a lot lower. Um, people have not been attending these services as much. Um and, uh, and that, I mean, you know, that kind of sucks because it is one of those things where it sucks in the sense of like, I feel like some of these preachers believe in the religion itself. Like they are like, hey, don't judge each other based on skin color or who people choose to love. Love everybody. Make sure your neighbors are taken care of. Have a sense of community, which is kind of like what the point of religion is. Have a sense of community. Take care of each other. Make sure that you're that you love each other. Make sure that, you know, if if your neighbor doesn't have uh, something they, they and you do like share that with them, you know, like, um, remember how Jesus beat the shit out of bankers. Maybe that's a thing we should try to do. Uh, maybe we should be going to wall street and beating the shit out of some bankers. I don't know. These are just things in the book, like maybe socially distance, maybe use some common sense. And I feel bad that the numbers are declining for these, um, uh, online services, you know? So, the real question is, will religiosity increase or decrease because of because of COVID-19 and the way that churches and different religious organizations have been acting in in this situation? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty unsure based on these things. Right. Because you have a lot of different sort of reactions going on right now, uh, because you could very much have um, a, a revival of enlightenment in people. Um, you could have an evolution of thought in people after all this, uh, because collectively, uh, we are, um, we are, uh, 
we're going through a very difficult time right now collectively as a as a species as as a as as human beings right uh, as the working class we're going through a pretty tough time and so when we get out of this we are indefinitely going to be changed we are going to be coming out of uh the article i read called it the collective ptsd and that's possibly true um but what are we going to do with that are we going to just go back to complacency right are we going to go back to just doing things the way that they were done or are we going to push harder and pay a lot more attention to what the real problems in the world are, not the superficial ones, not the, oh, Trump tweeted this thing. Yo, he's an or like, no, those are all superficial bullshit. There's real authoritarian problems that we need to push back against, right? There's, you know, are people going to kind of wake up from that and have this moment of enlightenment? Or are they going to do what, what the other possibility with this religiosity is that when we come out of, when we come out of this, people will sit there and be like, see, I knew it. I had my faith the whole time. I knew it. If I just believed in Jesus enough, I knew that Jesus would get us out of this. And it's like, I don't think that's what fucking did it. And that's the question that um, um, that we have. And, and it could go either way because you have a lot of people that are trusting and paying attention to the science, understanding that, you know, hey, we don't have all the answers. Um, you know, but but what we do have is a uh, broken and corrupt economic system that is not working, that is not helping us in this, in this current situation. So we have to kind of act uh, differently in that. Um, so, but then there are also other people that are like, I want to get a haircut. I want to go back to work. I want to be a corporate slave, you know, like, so it, it, it just keeps going back and forth. Um, so I don't really have a definitive answer, but but it does look like it does look like, you know, there is a portion of people that did have faith that did go to church that are looking at people that are saying, hey, come come to these services, attend all these services. We're going to open up the churches specifically for these services so we can collect your tithings um, and make money off of poor people and exploit your fear. Um, they're looking at that going, yeah, no, I don't. That is not why I choose to believe in a higher power or anything. And there are people that are going to these online services too, that are kind of looking at it going, you know, this is not doing anything for me. Um, and part of the online, the, the decrease in the online services is like, no, what I really miss is the, the, the sense of community. Uh, so, you know, I, um, I don't know. I'm not sure what the exact answer is, but it, it is interesting to kind of see that there is two sides to this, that there aren't hundred percent religious people and there aren't hundred percent like atheistic people, which means that there's still work to be done. There's still, there's still, you know, uh, a lot of humanity that, that needs some enlightenment in their life. Um, we got a few comments for this section. Nick Green, do we need to wear our sunglasses inside? Absolutely. I do because I'm straining my eyeballs. Uh, <laughs> that's why I'm wearing my sunglasses. Um, I've been wearing these sunglasses during all of my videos because I have a pretty bright spotlight here that you can kind of see when I wave my hand over it uh, and the and the, the screen itself. I've, I've definitely increased the amount of screen time. So I'm wearing these sunglasses so that uh, uh, I, don't, I don't burn my eyes out. Um, we need we should be testing everyone for at least antibodies because uh, this has been going around since uh, January and definitely February. Yeah, you're right. I think we should be looking for antibodies. Um, that is a way that, uh, that, that we can move forward with this. Um, the vaccine is about 12 to 18 months away, but the antibodies are good um, because the antibodies are your body's natural defenses. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think the denial phase of, um, of American hubris really prevented us from uh, um, like social distancing to, to the utmost level works really well when you catch it early, right? When it's like, shit, there is about a 0.1% a, a, a of our population that has this thing. Okay. Socially distance for um, two to four weeks. Great. You know, and then you put economic provisions in place so that, uh, um, you know, people don't starve or die or lose their jobs and things of that sort of thing. But th we didn't do any of those things. We hit it late and then we pretended like we didn't hit it late. Um, so now I think, you know, we really got to try something a little different 
where we, uh, what we, I mean, what we really need is a plan, right? We do need testing. We need testing of people getting the virus itself and we need testing for people that have antibodies themselves. And the testing right now is only available to rich people. Uh, it's too expensive, even if you have insurance, it's too expensive. We, it should be free for everybody, especially in a global pandemic situation, uh, but it's not. And uh, it, that's fucking dumb. Um, and it's irresponsible of a government not to do that. Uh, and our final comment, punch a Nazi in the face. Uh, you know, Nick, I'm, I'm against the punching Nazis uh, ideology. The, the, you're referring to the whole, you know, maybe we should beat the shit out of a banker. I know, I was doing a little character. Uh, but, you know, that is the only point where Jesus get, did get violent. Um, and I don't know if that's the right way to move about things. The whole punch a Nazi thing is, um, you know, they'll punch back. And realistically, um, they are in, on the same ground floor that we're at. Um, they are not some sort of elite. Uh, they are not some sort of economic rich elite um, that is trying to control the narrative and exploit people. I think they just have a lot of fear uh, and they turn that fear into anger and hate and they're very misunderstood. So I'm against the punch of Nazi thing, uh, but I do understand that they're not going to want to sit down and talk to someone like me. Um, and my policy is I did a whole video about this. I used to do this on stage. Uh, about why I'm against uh, the whole Nazi punching thing. Uh, first of all, I'm a pacifist, so there's that. I would much rather sit down and talk to you about why you believe in what you believe in, uh, so there's that. Um, and try to understand where your your emotions are coming from, where your fears are coming from. Uh, but I also understand that that's not going to work 100% of the time, and that's when, you know, folks that are in the punch and Nazi camp are going to be waiting behind me. So the alternative is pretty clear is either you can sit down and we can have a conversation or these 10 people are going to want to punch you in the face and kind of see which one they'll, they'll end up picking. Uh, but uh, I understand why, why that comment was, was, was thrown in there. Um, yeah. But that is the end uh, of this live stream. We have come to the final end of this live stream. Um, if you enjoyed it, if you uh, if you caught it live, or if you didn't ca catch it live, because uh, these will end up being on Facebook uh, till the end of time, um, you know, uh, uh, you can become a sustaining member. You can donate at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. Uh, it basically helps support me through this difficult time, but it's not a necessity. I'm putting out content pretty much every single day and all of my content will be available for free. Um, keep your eyes peeled for the ticket links for my live Zoom stand-up comedy show. Keep your eyes peeled for all the promo stuff for that because I do have some cool promo things that I'm excited to, to release out there. Uh, for you guys, um, I'm Pittsburgh Fringe this Saturday, May 2nd, 9.30. I'm going to be doing a storytelling show with some interactive elements uh, over Zoom. Um, so you can uh, attend that. There's The ticketing stuff is going to be available for that pretty, pretty soon. Keep your eyes peeled for uh, all of that stuff. And uh, again, every Sunday, I'm going to go live. Uh, so you can kind of interact and have some conversations with me while we go through some of these stories that we are going to be talking about. Um, and, uh, the beginning of these are always awkward. They're always awkward because I have to sit there and do a, you know, invites individually of people. I have to share them to groups because, uh, my content isn't particularly shown to as many people all the time. Um, so, you know, um, I have to do, I depend very much on people sharing the content out, making sure that they're subscribed and hitting that bell. So they get that notification of when I'm putting up videos and when I'm going live itself. So if you haven't done that, please do that, uh, and get notified of what I'm doing. And that way, at least, uh, it will decrease the amount of awkwardness that the, uh, the, the live stream start in. So, uh, yeah, I think that is, that is sort of the end of the live stream. Um, Please share the content. Please like the content. Uh, go to my website if you want to make a donation. Uh, all of my albums are available as pay what you want. And uh, I'll be putting up videos every day. So stay tuned for those. Uh, but uh, till tomorrow, enjoy the rest of your Sunday and we'll see you on the road.